Thanks a lot for coming, especially on a Friday night. You know, you should be spending time with your families. And the fact that you are here, it, it means that you are very interested in this topic. Yeah? So before we start with this uh, talk, um, just a couple of uh, housekeeping matters. First of all, um, for any emergency, there are actually four doors, two behind you and two in front of you. Okay, and of course, secondly, uh, may I request that you switch your electronic gadgets to silent mode? Okay. Uh, again, thanks a lot. My name is Ken Lam. I'm from the local community engagement office. Um, uh, this is the 14th edition of our Did You Know Monday Talk series. We started in July last year. Um, now, why are we doing all this? You know, NTU has been doing quite well in terms of research and education. And I think it's important for us to leverage on that to actually um, benefit our community as well as Singapore at large. So one of the many initiatives we rolled out is this uh, talk series, which is also a public lecture. So um, on the last Friday of the month, we invite uh, one of our, or maybe a number of our professors to talk about his or her own area of interest. And um, the, the purpose of, his, of it all is to um, um, help Singaporeans uh, understand and appreciate research and its benefits. I think, I think that's important. And of course, when you're here, we also hope that you can actually spend some time uh, you know, exploring NTU. NTU has, has changed quite a fair bit. In fact, if you go around, you'll see a lot of new buildings. We have um, um, added in many new uh, dormitories. We call them Hall of Residence. Today, we are able to guarantee um, uh, on-campus housing for both year one and two students, undergraduates. First thing. Second, second thing is that we also, we also added a lot of nice buildings. You know, on your right hand side, there is this Hive Learning Hub. We also have um, a very nice uh, indoor sports hall called the Wave. We've got another Learning Hub at the northern side called the Arc. And, and if you read the newspaper, you will have known that uh, we are building a new, um, 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 almost, what, 90 over percent um, engineered timber building, probably the biggest of its kind in Asia. You know, it costs us $180 million, and that is mainly for our school of business. So a lot of nice things coming up, and seriously, uh, you have time, uh, please explore NTU, because we have transformed, in a way, from a university to a mini city. Detroit is a mini city. We have more than 40,000 uh, people, you know, on this campus itself. So, um, you know, to, to ask you to come all the way to the western part of Singapore, one is to, you know, learn a bit more about NTU. Yeah. Um, so today, um, the program for today will be as follows. Um, uh, I will invite our uh, first speaker, Professor Ang, to um, give a bit of intro, maybe five, six minutes. And after that, he will pass on to, to uh, Professor um, um, uh, Essen um, uh, Tantok for about 20 minutes. And then uh, Mr. Benjamin Ang will actually continue for about another 20 odd minutes. And then Prof. Ang will actually wrap up. And after that, we will have a panel discussion followed by Q&A. So, um, so to, today's topic is very important. Uh, force online information, what's new from research and what can we do about it. So that is very important. So um, now, without further ado, uh, let me first introduce our first speaker, uh, Professor Ang Penghua. He's a professor at the Wikimedia School of Communication and Information at NTU, where he teaches and researches media law and policy. He has served on the Media Literacy Council for three terms and um, retiring this year as a vice chair. So without further ado, let's put our hands together to welcome Professor Ang, please. Hi, good evening. Yeah, thank you, Ken Lam. Okay, great to see you all here. Uh, normally, we put a popular and you know challenging classes on Fridays to see whether you're really motivated or not. So I can see you are really motivated. All right? Thank you. Um, so let me begin uh, just to give you kind of an, an intro about uh, the topic. Okay. So oops, this is my uh, rough agenda. I'll give the intro uh, and talk about also what will not be covered. I'll talk about the research findings. Uh, well, my colleague Ansel will talk about the research findings about Singapore. I'll talk a bit about that. Research findings for the so-called dark uh, web. And I put a dark in quotes and web because there is something called a dark web. But it's talking sort of a darker aspects of the web as opposed to the dark web. And then we'll wrap up with uh, what uh, can we do, uh, both as individuals 
and well as uh, citizens, and also what the platforms uh, can do. Okay. So uh, quickly, you've probably heard that uh, the false online information or fake news is, is old stuff, it's not really new. And somebody traced it back all the way to Adam and Eve, where the snake is supposed to have lied to, uh, to Eve, so that's false information. I know it's not online, but false anyway, right? Uh, so the question is, what is new, right? So, well, the first thing is that it's online, which makes it easier to pass on uh, and to just forward. It is a whole information. It's, uh, in, our, in the previous gen generations where there's no you know, written text, you pass on information, you get oral, right? And some of it will be changed, some of it distorted. And we know from research that <clears throat> when it comes to rumors, some things will be highlighted, some things will be played down. But with online, the whole thing is just passed on entirely. So the message stays intact, right? Um, and then it's passed on by users, not by propagandists. In the past, it's like a broadcaster, right? This person or entity or agency would uh, pass, it, uh, pass the information on, it's propaganda on, and then people listen to it. Now it is users passing it on, and the users may be your friend, maybe your mother, your father, you know, so some, some relative of yours, and actually happens a lot, by the way, the older uh, folks are the ones who are passing on this, uh, you know, uh, false information, right? And then, of course, it, the fact that this information, which is why we are all concerned, is that it harms society, right? We are seeing this um, leading to, in, in the case of India, uh, you've seen people have been literally being killed because of this, uh, you know, false information that they were, uh, in the case of India, child kidnappers, right? Uh, in Singapore, I know it's much milder, like NTUC losing sales of rice, you know, because people say they are selling plastic rice, right? But there is some, left, some degree of harm, and it's why we are concerned about this topic, right? Okay, so what, um, I will not, what we want to cover is the definition of fake news, right? And this is a whole research area in itself, because if I were to ask you, or your friends ask you, how are you? Many of you will say, I'm fine, right? But actually, we may not be totally fine, right? Maybe you're like, I actually don't want to be here, but somebody, my girlfriend is here, asked me to come, so I go, you know? Um, I don't want to be here, so I'm not really fine, you know? But you ask me how, you know, I'm fine, right? Um, uh, is anything bothering you? Like, oh, nothing, nothing bothering me. Actually, there are things bothering you, right? So, is that like fake news? If, some, if you ask somebody, that, are you fine, and the person says, not, um, you know, he or she is fine, but actually it's not. Right? So we don't cover that, as you can see, it's a whole, uh, a thorny area. This is such a major issue that you can have literally a whole tutorial you know, just discussing you know, how to define fake news, okay? But we're not in the tutorial, so we won't cover this, okay? Okay, and then um, also how to correct uh, the fake news, right? Uh, in fact, I was just talking to uh, one of my uh, RAs talking about uh, counter, counter, uh, counter attacking uh, fake news, right? Uh, not a lot of research there, and he's got an example uh, in, in Indonesia where people kind of responded uh, to it. Um, his theory is a uh, small world. When you, when you have false information coming to you, you retreat into your world of friends. Your world becomes smaller. Your friends, your trusted network, you don't go out anymore. You don't reach out. Your network is no longer so large because you are unsure of a network. You retreat to a small world to check. Who your friends you can trust? Okay, we ask this person. Your relatives, your trusted network. Okay, small world theory. So it's kind of interesting, uh, you know, approach. But we're not talking about this. Um, we're not talking about how, for example, it's actually very difficult and expensive to, uh, to fact check. No? Uh, Hong Kong University has a program where they use students to do fact checking. I thought, oh, fantastic program. Turns out that they train the students for about at least uh, six to eight weeks. Uh, in a 12-week course. And then finally, the last four to six weeks, the students actually do fact-checking. So one-third to half of the course only in one semester, right, is spent on fact-checking, right? So it tells you how difficult it is to actually, you know, uh, have the resources necessary to do uh, fact-checking. In fact-checking, one uh, major issue is uh, the issue of conflict of interest, right? Who checks the fact-checker, right? Then do you need a fact checker to check the fact checker who checks the fact checker, right? Uh, yeah, you know, complicated. It keeps us busy uh, all evening, right? Um, this is a, a serious matter because <clears throat> uh, the Washington Post, for example, has got a fact checking team, right? 
Um, the fact-checking team is accused of being anti-Republican because they have more errors at PIM on the Republican side than on the Democratic side. Okay, so how do you show that actually they are, you know, they are not biased, right? So it's a whole sort of uh, area within that. In Singapore, our newspaper, Singapore Press Holdings, has thought about having this uh, fact-checking, but they are aware of this problem. So in fact, they are not setting up a fact-checking team because they will be accused of bias, right? You may not be biased, but you will be accused of bias. So they are still talking about how do you uh, set this up, right? So, okay, tonight, we're not talking about that. Okay. Instead, um, we will, okay, we're talking a bit about how can we stop uh, this false information based on research. Okay, you need to understand where this is coming from, you know, what is happening, why are people doing this, and then we can maybe have to take some steps to, to uh, stopping it, right? And then uh, I will talk a bit at the end, uh, what can we do about it? Some of it, as you will see this evening, is literally <coughs> impossible to stop, uh, literally impossible. I think uh, um, my friend Ben will show some, some, some of the stuff that, you know, you see uh, it's impossible to stop, yeah? So in short, we're just doing um, this uh, third and fourth item, not the first uh, two. Okay, okay uh, so I'm going to now introduce my uh, two uh, colleagues. Uh, Edson uh, is an award-winning researcher. Uh, he makes the rest of the school look very bad, right? He just keeps winning these awards, and how come he win? You cannot win, huh? Okay. Uh, highly productive. Um, he, okay, so I'd like to tell the story. Edson, I'm sorry, I'm just going to take the story and you know, ask your permission. Um, he's from the University of Philippines, and that's kind of the most prestigious uh, university, and he's from communication, also very grand uh, a program. Maybe one of the oldest uh, communication program in, in, in the world, depending on how you kind of count, count it, right? So in the entire history of the program, they've only had one, like, one top student, uh, the top, top student, right? And that's Edson, you know, okay? So I know Edson, okay? I know. Okay, uh, the second speaker after Edson will be, uh, I told him I didn't ask him permission, I'm no, just, right. Um, and then uh, we'll be followed by, by Ben, Benjamin Ang. Um, ben had been a lawyer with um, Rajan Tan, uh, it's a big law firm, and Ben uh, is understanding doing something on I, IT uh, uh, law. Uh, Rajan Tan has uh, somehow spewed a number of lawyers who are in uh, the IT area, and they've, they've kind of gone out, right? Uh, currently, he's the president of the Internet Society in the Singapore chapter, and his own uh, areas is uh, in national security aspects of the internet. And in fact, he just came back from India last night. He's sort of from yesterday mo morning. I can't, can't remember when morning or night. <laughs> uh, from a cyber security uh, conference. Okay. So and then I'm going to invite uh, Edson to, uh, to give his presentation about um, uh, false information or fake news. Uh, from from research done in, in Singapore, right? Edson, please. Good evening, everyone. I am Edson. First, I'd like to thank uh, Prof. Ang for uh, the fake news that you're spreading about me. <laughs> but that's something you can verify online, so you can fact check. But sadly, we'll not be talking about fact checking tonight. Um, I'm very happy to share with you um, some results of the research that we've been doing at the Wikimedia School of Communication and Information. Um, one of my co-authors is here, Dr. Andrew Duffy, is in the audience. So we're part of a team that uh, we've been looking at different aspects of fake news. So we've run a series of studies. We've done focus group discussions. Um, maybe some of you might have attended our focus groups. Um, we've done surveys, and I've also ran um, some online experiments. So um, the findings that you will see will be coming from uh, different uh, research projects. Um, I will try to um, explain which project they're coming from, and if I don't, there will be some small notations uh, in the um, uh, presentation slides. So um, I'd like to start by first you know, um, talking about uh, giving an overview, um, why is this important to us? Why is uh, fake news an important topic to discuss um, in Singapore? Um, so this uh, uh, graph um, is based on a, a two wave surveys we've done. We first did it in December 2016, also did uh, another survey with, the, uh, part of it is the same set of people in 2017, December 2017, and we wanted uh, to look at trends over time. So one question we asked is, um, how often do you come across false news on social media? 
So again, th this question has a disclaimer. These are, the question assumes that people have correctly identified fake news. So it does not give us the actual um, extent of the problem, but it gives us a clue into at least those people who are successful in identifying fake news, how often do they come across one. So if you see from 2016 to 2017, there is a slight increase, um, which means you know, the fake news problem isn't over, um, and there are um, you know, scholars warning us that fake news um, is reinventing itself, coming into um, different formats. Uh, now we're dealing with manipulated video. So in short, fake news is, is still a serious problem at his, as it has been when we first heard the buzzword um, in, in 2016. Um, also another study that I'm part of, um, we did a survey of college students in four cities in Asia, um, including Shanghai, Taiwan, um, Singapore, and uh, um, Taipei, uh, Tai um, Shanghai, Singapore, Hong Kong, and um, Taipei, um, and this is a comparative. You can see. So we've asked them um, how. So we also have a third person effect, right? We 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 don't usually admit that we share fake news, but if you ask people how often have you received it from someone else, that would give us a, a clue into you know how the extent of the problem as perceived by people. So um, if you can see here in both items how often um, one of your friends believed in fake news or how often you uh, had a friend share a fake news, um, Singapore, at least they scored the highest in terms of um, just their perception of how frequently these things happen. So again, um, even if um, we don't I mean our, our problem with fake news in Singapore is not as serious as what we're seeing in India, we have a fake news problem uh, in Singapore, and we are um, uh, rightfully concerned about that. Um, why does it matter? So this is an experiment that we did um, with um, some of our students um, at the Weeki Mui School. So these are our communication students. So we train them to be good future journalists, um, good future advertising professionals. We're trying to train them to be good communication professionals. Um, but in this experiment, as you can see, what we did here was we showed them um, randomly uh, one fake news, one real news about the same topic, which is um, a dog, someone being arrested for selling dog meat. You, can you tell which one is fake and which one is real? So one uh, ha supposedly happened in New York, the other one supposedly happened in Bali. Yeah, so the New York story is fake, the Bali story is real. And then after exposing the students to these stories, I asked them how real or how fake they think the story is. So as you can see, um, in the, the fake condition, 41.8% of those who were exposed to them, to that story thought it was real. Um, those who were exposed to the real story, um, only 34.9% correctly identified it as real. So again, these are students who are trained to be good communication professionals, and even for them, it's not that easy to tell which one is real and which one is fake. So again, show, demonstrating um, that we have a problem uh, in terms of fake news. So that context drove us to think about, um, and this, yeah, this is something that actually went viral in Singapore. I don't know if you guys have seen that uh, a couple of years, I think two years ago. Um, but this has led us to you know, um, do research and try to understand what makes people vulnerable to um, believing in fake news stories. So here I'll be, um, tonight I'll be talking about four things um, that um, in our research uh, we've identified as important factors. First is we've relied on social media as a news source. Um, that's a good thing um, because now people who even do not intend to be exposed to news um, our young people, for example, they don't buy newspapers anymore, they don't watch TV news, but at least on social media they get exposed to news stories once in a while when their friends share it or if they follow particular pages. But that also has exposed them to fake news. Um, the second factor would be reliance on social networks. So when we think of source, 
in the age of traditional media, the idea of source was very straightforward. If you ask what's your new source, people say, well, Straits Times or a TV station, right? But now if you ask people what their new source is, some would say Facebook. And Facebook doesn't even consider itself as a media company. It considers itself as a tech company. Um, so this idea of a source on social media is very murky, right? Um, if your friend shares a, an article from Stomp, who is your source? Is it your friend or is it Stomp? And who you perceive to be your source will affect how you perceive that story and how much you believe in that story. Also, um, there are low motivations now for news consumption. Um, in general, um, as what we're finding in our series of studies, people are valuing news not for its informational utility, but more for its relational value. And that I'll talk about more later. And finally, I think there is what we call informational apathy. That is, when we come across something that's wrong, but it doesn't really concern us, then we don't correct it. But what happens is we don't stop that piece of fake news from spreading online, even if we are correctly, even if we're able to correctly spot that it's wrong. So um, in terms of social media as a news source, so this um, comes from um, a survey that was conducted by the Reuters Institute for the study of journalism at Oxford University. So they do um, surveys across different countries. I wrote the report for them in Singapore. Um, and as you can see here, Facebook and WhatsApp um, are still used uh, uh, by a, a large percentage of the population and increasingly um, used for news. The um, orange um, graph for Facebook, 52% represents a 2% decrease from last year, but WhatsApp is actually increasing. So more and more people are saying that they're getting their news from WhatsApp. Here's a, another um, survey that we conducted here in, in Singapore. This is based on 1,000 Facebook users um, conducted in October 2017. So here I asked them to rate how frequently they use different types, different sources of news. And as you can see here, um, reading news on Facebook is the most frequently, uh, Facebook is the most frequently used news source, um, outscoring, local TV news and local newspaper websites. So when I did this, the same survey, when I asked the same set of questions in 2014, when I first got here at NTU, um, newspaper websites were still ranked number one. Um, and two years later, Facebook has overtaken it. Um, so again, um, social media increasingly becoming an important, significant news source for an increasing number of people, even here in Singapore. And that has repercussions. Um, so I'm wondering, why are people turning to um, social media for news? Well, part of that is um, they are in these spaces, like young people um, or are on Facebook or, or WhatsApp all the, almost all the time. They shouldn't be there all the time, but um, they are in these spaces anyway. And so once in a while, even if they don't intend to read news, they will be exposed to news stories being shared by their friends or by pages that they follow. Um, so I, I thought of asking, but maybe it could be that you know, supposedly news consumption is driven by credibility, right? We consume um, information from sources we believed in. So I asked the same thing. So I, I in another, uh, in the same survey with a thousand Facebook users, I asked them how credible they think these different sources of news are. But I also asked them how entertaining the, the, each of these news sources are. You can see here, traditional sources are perceived to be more credible than social media and WhatsApp. Um, but Facebook, social media, and WhatsApp are perceived to be uh, more entertaining. And then that brings us back to the previous slide, right, where we see that Facebook is the highest, uh, the most used uh, news source, which tells me, and this is something that I still need to look into um, in and in, in do future research on, is that maybe we are consuming more news from less credible sources, which means credibility no longer means a lot to us. Um, it's not as important as it was before, or at least it's not as important as what journalists think, right? We train our, our future journal, journalists in our school that, you know, credibility is the main currency. If you're not credible, no one will believe you, no one will, will buy your newspaper, no one will watch your TV program. Um, but looks, I mean, based on, on these, and this is very preliminary, credibility doesn't seem to be the main driver of news consumption now. And that I think is worrisome. 
Um, another factor would be, you know, your friends, right? Um, as I've said, now we, we confuse who our source is. If something is shared by your close friend or by your, your parent um, or someone you have, you know, good relationships with, that might affect how much you value and in turn believe that information. Another thing would be our motivations. We're not always motivated to process news, and rightfully so. It would be very cognitively um, difficult if we're always on the lookout for information to process, right? So we select, we select information to process. And part of that selection might be based on who is sharing it and also what is relevant to us. And so in one experiment, um, I tested the interaction between source and motivations. Um, so I showed people um, a story that is either about Singapore or about other, another country. An example would be a tuition increase in universities in Singapore versus the same story, but I said tuition increase in Hong Kong. So we're varying um, the relevance of the story. And then I also showed this two type, two versions of the story um, attached to different sources. Um, it could be your own friend, or it could be shared on Facebook by Straits Times. So does that make sense, right? So uh, I varied the source, but I also varied the relevance of the story. So what we found, and then I asked them, how credible do you think this story is? So if you see, um, when people are highly motivated, when the story is about Singapore, the difference between the, the uh, Straits Times and one's own friend, so actually in the experiment, they saw the, a photo of their own friend supposedly sharing the story. So I created fake news for the experiment. Um, but if they are highly motivated, if the story is relevant, if it's about Singapore, they believe Straits Times much more than they believe the story when it's shared by their own friend. So it's good news for um, traditional media. They are still perceived to be more credible sources of information. But in the low motivation condition, when the story is less relevant, um, the difference between when it's shared by your friend or when it's shared by Straits Times narrows down. And I think this tells me, and again, very preliminary, but I think this tells me that when we are less motivated to process information, we rely on source cues for credibility. Say, this is not really relevant to me, but it was shared by my friend, so it must be important. Um, and a lot of the fake news um, that we see, you know, radioactive sushi or um, uh, cat meat and rat meat um, being sold as satay in Geylang, um, it might not be as relevant to you, but if it's shared by someone you have personal relationships with, then it might catch your attention and you might think that it's true. Um, and finally, uh, I think um, there's also informational apathy. Um, during the focus groups, um, and also based on the survey results I've shared with you, um, we're discovering that um, more and more people are actually just um, not doing anything proactive when they discover fake news. So again, this is also from a two-wave survey that we did. Here, um, I only represent the data from the 868 people who took part in the two surveys. So which means the data here is from the same set of people. So we looked at you know, different um, ways to respond to fake news, from posting a correction, blocking that person, reporting the post, and Facebook has this function. You can report the post and flag that as fake, and then they send it to a third party fact checker, and then um, if the fact checker confirms it's fake, then they take it down after like four or five days. Um, or you can just ignore the post. So as you can see here, um, most people would just ignore the post. Um, it's, uh, it was 75% in 2016, uh, down a bit to 68% in 2017. So there is at, at least um, a decreasing trend in terms of how many of us ignore fake news, but still most of us ignore fake news when we see it. And so it drive another research question, why are people not proactively correcting other people when they see other people sharing fake news? And there are three things. People only correct others when first uh, the issue is relevant to them. So you have the first quote there. So if it's not really important, they would just let it slip away. Second, they correct um, only those who they have either weak ties with 
uh, no, close ties with um, or those who they not ha don't, don't have any connections at all. So they refuse to correct those people. First, they don't want to correct people who they're very close with because they don't want to hurt people's feelings. So one of our focus group participants said um, her mom would share fake stuff once in a while, but um, she wouldn't tell her mom directly that what she shared was fake but would share another link saying, maybe consider this, because she didn't want to hurt her mom's feelings. Um, but we have also other people saying, well, if it's some person I don't really know, I don't have any relationships with, I, don't want, I will not correct that person because I don't want to get into unnecessary arguments. Um, so that's also understandable. But the thing is, these wrong posts get uncorrected, and they stay there online, and they get shared over and over again. Um, also, finally, um, personal efficacy. So a lot of the people we talked to said they don't correct because they don't think it's going to make any difference. Um, some said, you know, these people who share fake news, they already made up their mind. They have particular ideology or logic, and they can't be convinced otherwise. So even if I correct, it won't do any difference. So might as well not do anything. So I think there's what we call informational apathy working there. Um, so in conclusion, I think there, I would conclude uh, by, by arguing for two things. First, I think we need um, to improve critical ability so that people can discern uh, better which is fake, which is real, and know that part of the responsibility is not just correctly spotting what is fake and what is real, but also doing something to be able to correct that or at least stop it from spreading. So we can, you know, we've heard of um, uh, media literacy trainings. But I think part of that is uh, we, we need to encourage more and more people to consume news outside Facebook or outside WhatsApp. When we are in these platforms, we're not really in the mood for news. You know, we are in the mood for uh, looking at you know, uh, our friends' photos or cat videos or um, where did my, my uh, friend go for a vacation. We are not really in a particular mood to process important, serious information. And so when, when we're looking at someone else's photos or other people's memes and suddenly we see a link to a very important story, it's difficult to shift our mood from you know, being playful and fun and then suddenly appreciating a very important issue or a very important event. So I think we need to encourage more and more people to consume news outside social media. Um, and part of that, I think, is, is that would also strengthen our um, journalism industry. You know, uh, We need to help our journalists. Um, and again, People will argue across all countries, across me different media contexts, journalists have weaknesses. We cannot fully trust them. I am a former journalist, and I understand that. The difference is journalists have accountability. There are ways to make them accountable. We know their bylines. We know who they are. We know their email addresses. We can call them. If they get something wrong, there is a way to hold them accountable. But we don't have the same mechanism for fake news providers. Um, and so, I, I, again, being a former journalist, I'm probably biased, but I think we need to encourage more and more people to consume news outside social media and support real journalism and read real news rather than fake news. And finally, um, I, there are mechanisms on social media to report fake news. Google and Facebook are working on these things. They, have, they actually have um, functions that are available, but not a lot of people are using them. So I think one way that we need to think about and do more research on is how do we incentivize corrections? How do we encourage people to be more proactive and, you know, in a nice way, tell their mom that, no, sushi at this particular place is not radioactive. So I think I'll end with that. Good evening, I'm Benjamin Ang. I'm Head of Cyber and Homeland uh, Defense at the Center of Excellence for National Security, which is a policy research think tank based at S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies next door. And I um, want to thank uh, Penghua for inviting us to speak today, and also Kian Lam for inviting Penghua so he invite us. And today, I'm actually continuing on from what Edson was talking about. Hey, go ahead and take my chair. Uh, because a lot of this problem that he's pointed out that we tend to ignore, right? The fake news, we tend to leave it alone. Now, how many of you, quick show of hands, have been in some WhatsApp chat where somebody has shared fake news? 
You've been in some chat group where some uncle or aunt or cousin or your friend, your old school classmate in your old school reunion chat has spread fake news. Who has ever seen fake news in the WhatsApp chat? You have, right? Okay, please, please keep your hands up, okay? All of you who have actually told that friend, hey, that's fake, please keep your hands up. That's good. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, you are less than half. I, what I really hope to see is that the, all the hands will stay up. And I'm going to explain why. One of the big reasons, as Edson was pointing out, is that a lot of the times we think, what's the harm? It's just fake news, right? So, ah, yeah, more rubbish. I think we should just treat everything that we read online as rubbish. Well, based on the research that we were doing on the national security aspects of it, and Penghua spoke about it at the beginning, the harm to society. You think, how can this harm society? Surely that this fake news is not going to cause riots in the streets or people to get killed. Well, actually, it has in other countries. Surely Singapore is immune to this, right? Okay. Let's go uh, with my clicker. Fake news is only a small part of this thing called information warfare. When you see an iceberg, you're only seeing the top 10%. The rest of it is underwater, it's hidden. <coughs> Same thing with fake news. Fake news is only the visible part. And in order to understand this thing called information warfare, we need to understand, compare it against conventional warfare. Conventional warfare, you know, you see soldiers, you see tanks, you see planes, you see warships. It's causing direct physical destruction and injury. It still happens around the world because there are still battles going on. And the, root co and the objective is to cause the annihilation of the opponent. You want to kill and destroy. That's what the conventional war is for. And it's a war of weapons, technology and troops. So we are very used to this. We've seen it on TV, we know it from history, and we look at fake news and say, no, nobody's dying, right? How can there be a war? Well, information warfare is aimed at psychological influence, not at physical. And it's to cause the inner decay of the opponent. The modern war of today where it's played out between major states. And if any political science people are here, anybody political science? International relations? Yeah, you know this. It's no longer the top objective of nation states to destroy your neighbor. Because who knows, you know, they might be useful for trade. You destroy them, after that you take over, then you've got to rebuild that country. What a waste. Instead, why don't you let them rot from within? And it becomes a war, not of technology, but of your culture and ideas and perceptions. You see, when you take your soldiers and you cross a border, or you go with tanks and you go with planes, United Nations watches. <laughs> what are you doing? You're actually breaching somebody's territory. You'll get sanctions, you'll get... Worst case, some bigger nation ally will come in and attack you. So, war is no longer a very viable prospect for many conflicts. If you have a conflict with your neighbour, why go and waste money and bullets and bombs and your own soldiers and after that get condemned by international community when you could let them rot and kill themselves by using psychological warfare? And so, what you want to do is create a state of permanent total war. So I was wondering, should I make these circles into camouflage colours? And I realised, no. That's the whole point. The whole point, it is no longer a soldier in uniform. If you look at the, the latest conflicts in the world, not counting, how many of them actually have soldiers in uniform? If you look at how Russia went into Ukraine, they went in, well, maybe they didn't go in even because it happened to be Russian people going in wearing green uniforms with no country badge on it. Interesting, right? This is a war which cannot be traced back to the attacker because it is on the information front. It's also on the economic front. You can actually be buying your way into a country, infiltrating. It's on the political front. 
because you are looking at the country's internal politics, how people are getting along, and then you are manipulating that, finding where the soft spots are, where the parts where people don't agree. And then you also use technology. Don't forget, the technology we have is very good at spreading this kind of information. No longer do you have to have like a Voice of America radio broadcast station trying to broadcast in or try to be like North Korea and put a loudspeaker on your border. Or like World War II, you try and fly planes over and drop leaflets. I mean, that's old school. Now, all you need to do, $29 to buy a Facebook ad and only appears in the feed of the person whom you targeted and to nobody else. So what is the goal? Sun Tzu, in the art of war, says, to subdue the enemy without fighting is the ultimate skill. And there are some cultures in the world who learn from Sun Tzu. I leave it at that. So what are the main divisions that you can find? The most obvious splits we can find are extreme left and extreme right. If you look at the extreme left people on the extreme left, you're against mainstream media, you're against corporations, you're in favor of prison reform, you're against, in, the, in America, uh, in favor of Black Lives Matter, feminist, pro-LGBTQ. And if you're on the left, you like to consider yourself to be liberal, progressive, intellectual. On the extreme right, anti-mainstream media, pro-religion, anti-LGBTQ, anti-feminist, anti-globalist, that means against international trade and things, anti-immigration. You consider yourself to be a respectable, upright, conservative. Now, in this room, you might have certain aspects which find yourself into either of these. And these are points which are being manipulated and can be manipulated. Or you may have friends. So what is the common message? Anti-globalism. The message is do not trust free trade, multinational business, global institutions, mainstream media, you notice that was at the top of both lists, immigration, science and experts, and traditional politicians. And we are going to hear this message. You will see it a lot in news that's going around. Quick, spread this because mainstream media is not going to spread it. Quick, spread this because you know, our politicians don't want you to see it. Quick, spread this because the scientific experts don't want to admit this is true. And what's the goal? Polarized society. In Singapore, so around the world, there are, you can split people by left and right, you can split them by race. In Singapore, we seem to have done a pretty okay job in, in keeping the race and religion issues. Uh, let's not be, don't get complacent. But there are definitely two kinds of divides which I'm seeing in our research are popping up a lot now. Elites versus heartland. Look at those people, they make so much money, how do they know how the real person feels? They look, they make so much money, they tell us how to save money. Right? Local versus migrant. We have this, not really a joke, that if you see anything happening, uh, any controversy happening in a Facebook post, you count about six comments down. By the six comments, somebody should have said, it's all the fault of the foreigners. These are the things which are popping up. It's also to degrade the economy. So all the things which we see, you know, oh, this product is contaminated, this company is doing that, reducing confidence in whether it's our banking system, our CPF system, to reduce confidence, because a lot of the modern economy is based on confidence. When people are no longer confident, the economy suffers. To demoralize society, to create a sense of, look, you know, these people can get deferment from NS, why this one cannot? 
Why is there different rules for different parts of society? Not worth fighting for. And to stimulate just pure unhappiness, which there is so much, create a sense of chaos. Things are so bad now. Things are worse than they've ever been. Nobody is looking after us. These are the common message that we are going, seeing being circulated. And we are seeing them in the messages. And individual messages are not, none of them individually is going to destroy our society. Let's be very honest. That's why we have let these things go. Individually, these messages seem oh, irritating, but what could they possibly, what harm could they possibly do? But the whole idea is to split up and break down the target. And who is the target? It's us. And who might want to target us? Any number of people. Because can you think of any nations that might benefit if our economy didn't do so well? Can we think of any nations that might not be so happy that we have a certain amount of prominence and influence in the region? Can you think of any nations which might not be so happy about the public announcements of policy that we make? Or even domestically, are there people who might be dissatisfied and want to cause chaos? So all of these are contributors towards this. And what are the tools? So there's media, and then there's media. There are no shortage of website, news sites from outside Singapore who have uh, a lot of things to say about Singapore. There are even news sites that are supposedly from inside Singapore that have a lot of things to say about Singapore. We're not talking about the mainstream. And of course, the great narrative in this is, if you remember the earlier slides, don't trust the mainstream, because the mainstream is biased. Trust me, I'm independent. I'm telling you, everybody's lying to you, except me. You can trust me, because they're all lying. And this media is then spread through social media. And through social media, I should also say WhatsApp, which is not technically social media, it's messaging. But basically, it's that whole thing through the social network. And then, in the research that we've done, in many countries, this is now a problem. NGOs, politicians, activists, and academics even, are part of this influence operation. So that this thing is being a multi-pronged approach. Australia has already had a big in, uh, issue with these different forms of foreign influence. In Singapore, we've already expelled one academic for being an agent of foreign influence. So these are, and these are not people whom you are following their Facebook feed, but they are in places of influence. They could be in front of a lecture theatre, standing at a podium, trying to brainwash you. Maybe I shouldn't have put it that way. <laughs> the third one is business groups. Business groups and business people, business leaders, are vulnerable when they are doing business in countries which want to exert influence. It is not their fault. Huh? It's the fact that they are doing business, and in fact, our country rec ad, you know, strongly encourages our business leaders to go out, because Singapore is a small market, we have the whole region, and go and trade, especially trade with big countries. And of course, big countries have an agenda. So if you happen to be doing business in a big country, and that big country has a message that they want to be sent into Singapore, and basically you are trying to do business there, you know, you have certain options of what you want to do. So they are under uh, pressure as well. And finally, human and automated comments. So there are, as we have seen in the past years, teams of people who have fake accounts who will spread fake news, and then they'll go in and comment. And there will be dozens of people 
with hundreds of accounts in different names, all adding in their comments, adding pepper, add salt, add sambal blachan. It looks as if there is a huge number of people who feel this way. And this is our thinking. Say, wow, if so many people feel this way, maybe they are right. It's very normal because we are conditioned to be with the majority, right? Worse still, there are automated con comments. So there are software programs called bots, which are written to repeat these fake comments. The old ones were easy to spot because everybody says the same thing. Hey, how come these five people all say exactly the same thing? But now they're smarter. They change the wording. They move the words around. So it really looks that there are hundreds, if not thousands of people, all with the same view. And when we read all this, we think, wow, this is really serious. Huh? At first, I only saw the headline. It didn't seem to be that serious. But now, wow, thousands of people seem to believe it. There must be something true about it. So these are the tools. And when we look at the human tools, I'm sorry, but we are also the human tools. Because it works very well. Why does it work very well? Because the weakest spot in this whole thing is between our ears. This is the weakest link in the whole chain. Through discussion with anthropologists, we identified a few factors of which these are two. The first one is we have a desire to protect our community. If we think back to the old hunter-gatherer days or in, in tribes, if you hear something dangerous, you need to tell all your friends, your neighbours, your family. Like you see, oh, you know, if you happen to walk into that part of the jungle, there's a tiger there. So better tell everybody because you don't want somebody to walk in there and get eaten by the tiger. If you see this plant and this plant is dangerous with this kind of leaves, you better spread because you don't want all your neighbours to go and eat that plant and die. We are doing this because we care about our society. We even have the idea of sharing is caring. It's not. It's being abused, is being misused, is being manipulated by this. And a key to that is to understanding that this is being tapped on. Because there, especially when in this current environment where news is being consumed on social media, how many of you have ever read the post by your friend just see the headline and started to have emotional response. Just see the headline and without touching the reading the actual um, story, already inside yourself, you begin to feel emotional about the headline. <coughs> I see some honest hands, right? The rest don't bluff. <laughs> because the, the headlines are there to create the response. And is to draw your attention in and to create that sense of fear, the sense that we need to protect our friends by spreading this. Many people are spreading stories without even having read the actual story. They just see the headline is spread because of this fear. Second one is our need to find patterns in what we observe. Again, anthropologists have told us this is because in the more primitive societies, we would have tried to find, understand patterns and try to derive a, a theory of why things are happening. And that's how we have science, because we actually studied things and found patterns. But when you're on WhatsApp, you're not conducting a scientific experiment. You're just seeing, oh, somebody shared this. And when things are happening in this world, sometimes when things don't go the way that we think they should, it's easy for somebody to then derive a conspiracy. It's a conspiracy. See, so and so, wow, how come this one uh, in a high position happens to be the cousin's uncle's grandfather of that one who's also in high position? It must be because they're the same family. It's a plot. Right? Yeah, you know that one, huh? We have a need to find patterns. And when we find, and when somebody gives us a pattern which looks plausible, we go back to that one. Oh, we better protect the community. Look, there is some family that's trying to put all there, all these cousins, all in different high-ranking positions. So, again, this taps into our very basic nature, which makes a lot of the things that we're talking about really hard. Because 
How do we fight this on a rational basis? This kind of information warfare is supposed to hit here, the heart, the emotional basis. And it's supposed to cause the disruption on an emotional basis. Why? Because the objective is to destabilize the society. And bit by bit by bit by bit by bit, you get cut, a thousand cuts until you bleed to death. This is why we look at this, how can we defend against information warfare? Now, having spoken to academics who have been in countries which are under information warfare, absolutely, uh, they are day to day getting um, this uh, particular, uh, one, one academic I spoke to said that every morning she wakes up and she finds her friends in other countries say, hey, we just heard there were riots in the streets in your country, the supermarkets are empty, there's looting, there's fires, are you okay? Then she says, yeah, I'm fine. I just went to the supermarket yesterday, or it was full. Um, all my kids went to school. Everything's fine. But they are under information warfare because they have a large neighbour who wants to destabilise them so that they can be easily taken over. They are resisting. And how do they resist? First of all, they have been building trust through com transparent communications. It's only we will believe because it comes at an emotional level, we will believe who we trust. And through increased face-to-face -face contact, it's easy to condemn anybody online when we don't see them, but it's very difficult to condemn people when you see them face-to-face. -face. So when there's more face-to-face -face communication, there is better communication. And we don't have that kind of polarizing of very sadly, I have friends on both extremes where one will consider everybody with uh, left-facing views to be evil and uh, wanting to destroy society, and the other one on the right says everybody with right-facing views is evil and wants to destroy society. They, if they would get together face-to-face -to -face over a tetare or something, or a kopi, the communication will be very different. Teaching critical thinking, of course, is important. That's a really a fundamental thing, as they were talking about earlier. And the resources are already there in Singapore. Like, for, for example, National Library Board has this program called SURE, S-U-R-E. Four is understanding and publicizing the tactics, which is what I'm hoping to do today. To understand why people do this. And so that we understand that it's not just harmless. It's not just, ah, uh, ignore it. That we need to actually be aware so that we are not part of the problem. And then number five, if we are aware, we build a culture of not sharing this kind of thing. And not just not sharing, helping those who share to be more aware so that we are not part of the problem, part of the solution. So if we can do all this, we have a better defense against information warfare, and then we have a culture where we are stronger and more resilient. Thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you, uh, Edson and Ben. Um, I've asked them to talk because they really uh, show you the spectrum of research that is uh, in Singapore on this. Uh, for, for Ben, I don't know if you all live with a sense of like uh, paranoia, but some of the stuff that they do, uh, they, they can't even. Um, uh, talk about them uh, at the select committee. So there's some closed door session for the work that he has done as well. Uh, and yeah, it's based, it, is, it is based on, on uh, research. Uh, I guess this is a question you have, right, after hearing uh, these, right? Okay, so I'm talking about um, what do we do next? Huh? So um, I said that what we do depends on the, the, the causes, right? I just came across this uh, article while uh, preparing for this uh, talk. Uh, this is on Guardian, it means uh, last Saturday, uh, and uh, talking about how skim reading may be affecting the way that we understand uh, content. Uh, so that both uh, Edson and Ben are talking about uh, reading outside of social media. Uh, this is talking about reading on your smartphone, right? Um, and because of the way that you read, we, we read so much content, so we skim, and we don't digest uh, deeply. Uh, in fact, this article uh, talking about the Z form of reading, right? You read the first line, you Z down, and then you read the last line. And this is your reading of the paragraph, right? 
you put a finger there, in fact, it teaches you how to skim read, right? Like 2,000 words a minute, okay, so you skim read. Okay. Um, so this is interesting because um, it suggests that uh, the, the medium that we use, the smartphone that we use for, for our reading of news, affects how we understand news. Right? And actually, the, there's research showing the medium alone uh, influences uh, the way we respond, right? Uh, so it's something you might want to uh, consider. And in fact, Equis says that for, uh, for those who want to read uh, critically, uh, maybe you should read it in, in hard copy, okay? as opposed to just being on a, on a device. I have I'll a little bit more to talk about uh, this in a bit. Okay. So from what you hear, I think one uh, uh, common point on this is to reduce uh, social media use. Right? Um, and actually, you see this happening already. Uh, social media use has declined. I think Edson was pointing out a bit of that. Uh, Facebook themselves, they have taken off like 600 million uh, fake accounts and they themselves are having their share price go down because of uh, lower usage of their uh, medium. Right? Um, the thing is that Facebook is aware of the problem. Uh, I actually have written something about this in op-ed uh, some time back, uh, how the, the social media sites will respond. The reason is that uh, in the advertising area, in order for us to so-called trust advertising, right? I mean, to at least read and, and respond in some way, you have to trust the platform it is on. So Facebook has to be in some way trusted. I know the ads we don't trust entirely, but we cannot entirely dismiss them. So Facebook, your Google Hangouts, all your social media sites, they will do something to try and restore trust. So Facebook's under a lot of pressure now to do something to uh, restore trust. They've in fact created research uh, uh, grants. I just applied for two uh, a couple of weeks back um, uh, on, on WhatsApp, looking at uh, how WhatsApp is being used. Okay, I mentioned also that um, we talk about uh, reduced use, right? Not no use, eh? uh, because one of the, I'm doing some work in, in India, and um, one of the comments in, one of the responses in India is that they cut off social media use. Because in places like Kashmir, where uh, you have the social media being accused of spreading rumors. But the social media people, the people who use social media tell me that without social media, they cannot confirm or deny the rumors. So on balance, although yes, social media is used to spread rumors, social media is also used to deny rumors. And without uh, the social media, then people cannot confirm or deny, so they act as if this is true. So on balance, all things considered, it is better to have social media. But in the case of how we do it, maybe to reduce uh, uh, the use of it. Uh, I've made a point also that the, the messaging uh, apps are being uh, increased in the use, and uh, Edson talked about that. Because we don't trust uh, social media so much, so we're using more of your uh, messaging. But it does mean, uh, this the point that uh, uh, both Ben and Edson have talked about, that we have to correct people who send us wrong messages. And in terms, because it tends to be uh, sort of the same people, I don't know, your, your WhatsApp group, same people sending the same you know, kind of fake news, telling, hey, this is wrong, and they keep sending this, you know. Different versions of it and telling them it's wrong, right? Uh, interestingly, both of them have talked about building trust, okay? Uh, and all three were so busy that we had no time to meet just, except met just now, and so kind of we gelled even though we didn't kind of meet. So, so no conspiracy here, right? Uh, the research uh, uh, converged, right? So um, building trust is important, uh, having what I call, I call here social capital. Okay, so on this element of trust, uh, if you look where um, uh, Singapore stands, right? This is from the uh, Reuters news report that uh, Edson had quoted. Uh, so this is part of the work that Edson had done. Okay, indicate a level of agreement with the following statement. You can trust most news most of the time in Singapore, right? And so you see Singapore, um, we are somewhere in the middle, okay? Um, and this covers most news. Research by, done by my other colleagues uh, indicate that Generally, news in Singapore we can trust, uh, except for the political stuff. There's a big question mark around the political stuff. Yeah, uh, this is yeah, it's out there. We, we know that. So we have a relatively high level of trust. It's not a not a bad situation uh, uh, to be in. Okay. But one of the things that we know uh, is that our level of trust is linked to your the view of, of media bias. Okay, you're seeing this, uh, and if you look at our local papers. Uh, uh, both today and, and, and uh, Trace Times, they are trying to be uh, fair. I'm just thinking of the most recent coverage of elections, uh, Bukit Bato, and the Trace Times was scrupulously down the middle, okay? Opposition and the BAP 
same amount of coverage, and then the other next day it'll turn around and like you know left side, right side, it switch around, right? Right side is supposed to be more weighted because our eyes sort of go to the right. But in the case, they actually move it left and right, and opposition even appear on the front page. Kind of got a like surprise, like, hey, what happened? Eh? It's actually, you know, fair and balanced, right? If we expect that because the, the paper is controlled to some extent yeah, uh, by the government, that they would, uh, you know, be in favor of, uh, you know, pulling a PAP up there, right? But no, I think they are aware of this issue of trust, and so they are trying to be uh, fair and balanced, right? Uh, so one of the things that I think that we, uh, the research that we have seen shows is that whether we believe something is true or not doesn't just depend on whether this thing is a fact or not. It depends on our emotions, right? I think you've seen this uh, recently, especially uh, certainly most evidently in, in the U.S. In the situation, right, where uh, people believe lies, right? Uh, notwithstanding the fact that you can prove that it's a lie, but still people believe that this is true. Right? And it's based on your, your ideological position, your motivations, right? your prejudices. Okay, so I mentioned what can we do, right? This is my, on my deck here. Um, I think both of them had mentioned this point about um, looking to news, right? To, to, to support quality news. Okay. Um, and you're seeing this actually happening in the West. Okay, so news circulation is increasing. Uh, they call it the Trump bump, right? Uh, Trump has actually increased sales of uh, newspapers. Um, the New York Times uh, online circulation has increased. In fact, um, the market value of New York Times has overtaken the SPH. I don't really know. SPH was, uh, for one time, one of the three newspapers in the world that turned away advertising. The other two were uh, uh, Economist Magazine and South China Morning Post. And then the Straits Times turned away advertising. Too many ads, sorry, we cannot uh, run your ads, right? Um, and then, of course, the uh, situation has changed. But you can see that um, people are turning to your trusted news sources. Right? Um, and as Essen has pointed out, right, without this quality news, right, uh, you, you would fill up the, the, the vacuum with your other uh, junk, right? So the thing is to try and fill this space with, uh, with quality news. So I'll say subscribe to Straits Times, you know, read today, okay? Okay, and then, um, interestingly, Ben has talked about not having the not sharing culture, right? So do not pass on messages that tell you to pass on to friends. Okay, okay, this is a this is a okay. I I've uh, shared this with my uh, you know my secondary secondary one okay uh, 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 reunion group right, and I told them I know that's yeah, like last, literally last century la, last century friends. Um, I told them that hey, one of the tests they tell is fake or not is when they tell you to pass it on, right? Uh, so in my entire history that I've been tracking this, only 2.5 times that is not true. Okay, in other words, two times, okay, where it says pass it on, and it was true. The other rest of the time, when somebody tells you to pass it on, it's fake or scam or hoax or malware or whatever. Okay, the other half time we were not verified, could not verify it's true or not. Okay, so anytime somebody tells you to pass it on, okay, remember don't pass it on. Okay, all right. Okay, so on that note, I'm going to. Uh, okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask um, uh, Edson and Ben to come up uh, and to have a uh, Q&A. All right. Okay. And we will pass on information here. Um, we're going to have time for uh, Q&A, and I'm sure you have many questions, so uh, you know, feel free to uh, fire away your questions. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, ben, you painted a fairly lively picture of chaos, destruction, and disaster waiting in the wings. And I wondered what evidence is there that this stuff actually works? Simple question. Thank you. Uh, that's a good question. And there, the evidence is mixed on to how effective information warfare is. Um, largely also because once you can actually identify the information warfare, it's no longer effective. So in a sense, the most effective information warfare is the ones we haven't detected. So where there is unrest, and we can, it would have to be in hindsight. Um, Mind you, this has been going on since uh, time immemorial. Uh, if I go back through conscious history, the CIA has been doing it in the 80s and 90s in South America uh, to destabilize countries. And so what we do know is that 
uh, there are, uh, for example, the deaths in India that have been linked back to WhatsApp, those uh, messages being spread, those are usually cited as an example. Uh, you may have a view on that. Does that mean it's also fair for us to assume that Singapore is also destabilizing neighboring countries? Uh, I, I personally do not see any reason for Singapore to destabilize the neighboring countries because it's in our economic interest for everybody to be wealthy, to buy products from us. Yeah. So does the term information welfare also imply a kind of conspiracy theory that you are judging the information not based on the information itself, but you are judging it based on your, as your, your assumption about the purpose of the information maker or senders. So then this is the first part of the question. Then the second part of the question is like, because you guys decide to leave the definition of fake news aside, so I'm always curious that how do we define what is fake, what is not? Can you give us a like, like a, a, a definition that we can really carry on in our daily life? Yeah, thanks. Okay, so I'll, um, I've uh, done a paper just reviewing definitions of fake news. Um, and in uh, academic literature, you know, the term fake news has been used to refer to different things like political satire or um, news parody sites like The Onion, for example. Um, my own working definition is anything, um, it's a, anything that, uh, it's a series of information packaged to look like news but it's devoid of any factual basis. So it's a falsehood. It's under the category, the larger category of disinformation. So there's also the element of intention. There's also um, the element of facticity, that it's devoid of, fact of, of being factual. But my particular interest is that this form of disinformation is trying to look like news. Because in doing so, it feeds on you know, the um, uh, credibility that our societies have come to associate with real news. So for me, that is my definition. And looking at the information warfare aspect of it, my point was not to have to judge each piece of news because it's just too difficult to look at each piece of news and have to then um, decide, do a fact check. You know, how many, we, we, we are, for goodness sake, we're scrolling through Facebook while waiting for my next turn at the bank, right? I mean, I don't have time to go and fact check before my number gets called. But Ping Wan's indication was, you know, if it says pass it on, usually it's a good reason to not pass it on. Just like when you get an email which says, this is not a phishing email, please click on this link. <laughs> usually it's a sign, don't click on the link. I would err on the side of not sharing something which looks uh, controversial, it looks like it's going to be, unless I personally have checked that it is true. Especially if I agree with it. If I agree with it, I think it's even more dangerous because it's, that means it's being adjusted to fit my personal biases, of which I have many. So we, the, the safer thing is to check before we share. The idea is don't share right away. If you feel that you're motivated, you want to share it, by all means, do your own analysis to check whether it's factual or not before you do so. Okay, um, I'm to be, be, to be blamed for uh, not having including, uh, included defi the definition because I didn't think it was that interesting, frankly, right? So I was, I was trying, more, kind of trying to get more sexy stuff out, out, out there. Um, the thing about um, this area of um, uh, issue of what is fake news is that uh, once you start trying to regulate it, right, this thing shifts because there's some intention behind it. Some, it's, not, uh, it's not like um, uh, something that's just sort of uh, an object, you know. This thing moves because once you try and pin it down, you know, the people behind it move. So in fact, we had a, a researcher come uh, from Oslo, Oscar, right? And um, he was saying how uh, what they're detecting was uh, certainly a part of, of Europe. Um, clearly biased journalism, okay? But done in such a way that you cannot say it was uh, it's fake. Okay, so there's, you can you cannot say it's fake, you know, and neither can you uh, actually kind of pinpoint that it is biased, right? They they try and balance it, 
I, I told you about straight time balancing it, right? So left and right, you know, the page amount of space all, all balanced. But when you read it clearly, there's some intention to skew it to one point of view. Right? So in other words, once you try and pin down, right, this thing moves. And um, so actually it, it will it will still aim to cause some uh, harm or some, you know some disruption in some way, but actually to, to pin out is actually quite uh, quite challenging. So that's kind of the next stage of where this whole business of you know propagandizing will, will, will move to. That seems to be the next the next stage. Yeah. So it's a tricky business and will keep us employed for a while, yeah. You have told us uh, a good way of restricting fake news, not to forward anything that we have not fact-checked. But what are the resources that one can use to fact-check? Uh, so one sim a, a simple thing would be um, when we see uh, suspicious news articles with a photograph, right? Uh, we can do a reverse Google search um, and see um, if this photo has been used in the past. So we've had that exercise in, in one of my classes um, where they look at uh, a photo accompanying a story of a man supposedly to have done something weird or funny. And that same picture has been used in a number of different other fake news articles to have done something else, something else, or uh, um, did uh, another weird thing in another context. Um, so I think a, a reverse Google search would um, it would be, it's very helpful, it's simple to it, it's readily available. One example would be in the Philippines where one government official um, in criticizing um, the opposition who are criticizing um, the government for um, declaring martial law in a region, she, she said that um, the government official shared a photo of um, soldiers spring, saying that instead of criticizing the government, we should just join our soldiers in praying for peace. Uh, and th that's a, a very powerful message. But if you reverse Google search the photo, this is a photo from Ecuador. They're not even Filipino soldiers. <laughs> so that's a, one simple tool. Um, hi, my question is actually uh, for Edson. You had mentioned that uh, you know a user or a consumer should consume news outside of social media. I was just a little unclear about what did you mean by that, because as a normal or an average user, if I'm shown a link which is linking back to say a Washington Post or a Wall Street Journal, I would certainly click on it because behind it, there's a credible source. So if you can just explain uh, what did you mean by that? I, th I think that most people who get their news primarily on social media uh, get news incidentally. So they're not really in the mood for um, um, looking at news stories. Um, and I think uh, basically what I'm arguing is um, first we need to get people to be motivated in looking for news. And um, incidental news exposure shouldn't satisfy our news consumption for the day. I think we, before you know if you're, if, you're um, if the only source of news for you is watching the 6 p.m. news, you have to go through the whole thing, even if you're just waiting for the um, uh, uh, celebrity gossip section. You have to wait until all the important news stories have been reported. Um, if you're reading, uh, if you're subscribing to a newspaper, you have to flip through the pages before you get into the comic section, for example. But on social media, um, most news consumption is incidental. So I think um, it's good if we come across important news stories um, on our news feed, we click on it, we read on it. But I think we need to be more disciplined in our news diet and try to get regular news diet from actual news sources in their actual platforms. In this way, we also help um, journal news organizations um, get traffic that they can then get advertisers or funders um, to, to, to so support them instead of making the rich Facebook giant even richer with our eyeballs and time spent and whatnot. <laughs> And talking about those uh, billionaire uh, platforms, I w at my last conference, I was in a side round table with Facebook. And one of the things that Facebook tries to do is, their philosophy is to try to increase discourse. So that many times when you report something, unless it's like really 100% fake, they don't take it down. Unless it violates their community standards. And I, when they went through the community standards, I saw, wow, it's not easy to take something down because they will err on the side of 
freedom of expression, let the thing be up so people can discuss it. But the problem is, when we are scrolling through Facebook, and what's the last time you scrolled through social media? What were you doing? Were you, you know, on queuing at the post office? Were you waiting for your turn at the canteen? Were you in the loo? Right? These are not times when we are ready for a real discourse or discussion or thinking or analysis of the news. These are times when we are really looking for cat videos. And then we see something which is controversial, which is that we look at it and we are, we are not in the right state. If you happen to be in the right state to think, okay, I'm now consciously going through my social media looking for news articles, I, I think that would be different. But how many of us do that, even in the loo? Sorry, can I just ask uh, whether there are studies done on like uh, Singaporeans and how savvy we are on the internet? Because I feel that there's this chilling effect about uh, uh, what transpired that we shouldn't do this and we shouldn't do that. It's like Singaporeans also have people who come out to correct, even our own friends, our aunts, our uncles, who, who are also purveyors of disinformation. But when it is called out openly, everybody else learns that this is wrong, right? But if we stop saying things and we start you know, keeping things out, so then we go into this siege mentality and back to the dark ages where we are, we are only reliant on one source of information. And that can be also very scary because if that source becomes corrupted in one way or another, then we are all susceptible to its effects. So, so I thought, like, if we are very resilient as uh, people, and, and we, yeah, we will call things out. Like, how how willing are most Singaporeans call things out like, when they find it out? Like, hey, this is this is a scam. This is fake news, and and they share, and it's also shared. Like you know, what uh, Prof Ang said, like if you take away that medium, that's the very medium that will remedy what is um, is the malaise. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think there's research showing how savvy we are. I mean, uh, you know, out of, maybe out of modesty or something, I don't know how savvy we are. Um, I don't see us being that different from others uh, out there. Uh, interestingly, when I ask uh, the, the students in my class, right, who in your WhatsApp group shares fake news? First, there's silence, and then some, they were all mutter like, my mother. Become kind of embarrassed, yeah. It's the older folks who are spreading uh, the fake news. And typically, and this one is definitely born out of our research, typically they, they uh, share the fake news out of concern. So you look at our uh, Singapore fake news, okay, they're not kind of political, uh, most of anyway, I think, but they're more like, okay, NTUC sells fake rice. Okay, be careful, right? And it's like, maybe it's real, maybe not real, but never mind, saying anyway, right? It, it, NTUC suffers a bit of, never mind, loss, that's okay, right? Um, so it's out of uh, out of concern. Um, I uh, I really don't see us being that different from others being savvy or not. Unfortunately, I do not think that we are that savvy as a nation, um, and because it's human, it's not a question of savvy or not. It's human nature. The two worst culprits in my friend groups, one is a law professor. I won't say which school. <laughs> one is a senior lawyer. I won't say which law firm. Right? These are supposedly educated, critically thinking people. And so I'll, I'll tell you who later. <laughs> but this, but it, it happens, we do share. I, I think we shouldn't get a chilling effect. In fact, it is good that we call out when, it, when we see it. And we should actually be actively searching for multiple sources of information. My golden age is not the pre-internet age. My golden age is, say, the 90s when we were, had so many sources that we could search for, but we did not share them randomly. We actually went, to get, went out to search for sources. Uh, just to add, um, I actually uh, I have a project um, and also did a national survey trying to measure and develop a measure of uh, social media literacy in Singapore. I have not analyzed the data, but I have it. Um, so I, I can get back to you on that. Um, but one thing that triggered that project is um, I been staying here in Singapore, we've had a lot of high profile um, social media blunders um, committed by highly educated, prominent people. 
Um, you remember the executive from NTUC, um, the Filipino nurse, um, posting really distasteful things on Facebook. I think a, a high-profile banker who had to move his family outside of Singapore. Um, and for me, these are uh, really highly educated um, people in high-profile um, positions and still committing such blunders. Um, um, extending that to fake news, um, we see a lot of um, corrections being made. Um, Mothership would point out, oh, this is trending on WhatsApp, and then people would comment yeah, that, this, that this post is really stupid. But um, we see those after at least someone, at least like Mothership or Straits Times or any um, organization has called it out as fake. But while it's spreading, we don't really see it because they, ha they, ha they occur on WhatsApp, um, uh, which is, you know, a bit, is a closed application. Um, it's not as visible as someone posting it on their own public timeline. Um, so I, I think it, we, we appear savvy because we gang up on um, fake news stories that have been um, declared as fake by an organization, but most of this, the, the proliferation or the spread, um, I think, is invisible. Okay, quick one before you uh, ask the question. Um, actually, at some point, any one of us can be taken in by, you know, something, if, if it presses our buttons. Uh, I remember, I, I was a journalist myself once, I remember this uh, senior lawyer, uh, and I got a tip off, he had been conned out of some per, out of $150,000, you know, which at that time was, you know, you could buy an apartment uh, for the money. Um, and uh, what happens to the senior lawyer, and I, and I got a tip off that he, this person got conned, so I call him up and say, hey, you got, is it true you got conned? He, oh, okay, now mind, I'll tell you anyway. Like, yeah. So he told me the whole story. Um, somebody just walked up to him uh, at, you know, in the office block, you know, and in his office, and then, you know, not even his office, but it's sort of his office building, right? Spoke to him and, and conned him of, of the money. Uh, and he was just like, you know, stunned, like, almost like hypnotized. He, don't think, he doesn't think he was hypnotized, but, you know, just talking, he got a lawyer, sharp guy, senior guy, who actually later on became high court judge, right? <laughs> got con. So at any point, I know it's just joking already, you know. At any point in time, any one of us can be, you know, uh, you know sort of the guy press the right button, and then you, you've been had, it's possible. So just now a, a point about fake news, right? So one of the, 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 the definitions of fake news, most legislation would have it, it has to be intentional uh, spread, meaning that you intend to cause harm. So if you just spread it, sort of extent, I mean, meaning to, co to, to, to sort of out of concern, to help somebody and not to spread harm, then you know you won't. So you have to show harm and all that. But that's uh, that's a point about how you know uh, savvy or uh, resilient you might be. You might still be spreading fake news. Okay, sorry, your question, yeah, yeah, no, my question directly refers to what you said before, uh, Prof. Hang, when you actually mentioned that. Um, well, current, oh, very blatant fake news are easy to recognize, right? And we can easily fa fact uh, check those. But, but what about those that give us half-truth? Those that um, are very difficult to fact check because some of the facts are there, but they, they, may, be, be, they may be distorted or they may be um, uh, not disclosed entirely. Now, I would submit to you that this is the real danger here. Those that are not recognizable as fake news straight away. And I've seen, I've been following um, discussions in Europe about Brexit and all of that sort. And the stuff that you see there is really frightening and very, very difficult to recognize sometimes. I think I mentioned at the beginning, this is precisely what I meant uh, by, in some cases, it seems impossible to fix. So it looks like this is the impossible area. Uh, first of all, it's very difficult to define. How do you define you know, bias, right? Especially when the, the author has deliberately couched the, 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 the article in such a way as to appear fair. Uh, and, and the person, the professor, who told us about this, said that if you were to look at it objectively, even three of us looking at it, will not say there are fact errors in this, you know, there are no fact errors, but the way it's written uh, is caught in such a way that, you know, it causes, uh, you know, some, some bias there. Um, and I think this is the point that I think Ben is uh, trying to point out, right, that some of this is actually difficult to, to pin down. Uh, it's kind of a dark side in a sense that it is, it is there, but really to actually pin it down is, is very challenging. Um, so this is the kind of the concern that, uh, that I have, I know that you know, others would have as well, uh, the, with the pending uh, fake news legislation, right? Uh, because one of the things about highlighting uh, fake news is that uh, you then create this sort of uh, concern, okay, there's, there's fake news out there, right? 
um, it's sort of like, okay, there's some dark person on the streets right now, right? Somebody wearing black in the street right now. And, oh, okay, well, you, you suddenly become more concerned. Um, I would say that overall, in Singapore, we have a high level of trust uh, in our institutions, right? If you say 7 p.m., three of us will be here, three of us will be here, right? Okay, <laughs> you're going to start at 7 or 5 or whatever, right? 7 o'clock, okay, straight, right? So we trust our institutions. Uh, we trust the government by and large in many things, right? That's why we, we say the government cannot, why can't, why can't the government do this, right? Because we trust it. We don't say, oh, no chance, the government cannot do this, you know? We don't say that, right? So they can, right? So we have a high level of trust in institutions. We trust our media for the most part, right? Uh, and so this issue of uh, highlighting fake news can cause some, uh, you know, discomfort, it's quiet. And so there's an issue of whether it kind of corrodes trust. So that's why it's very, very, very careful kind of the <coughs> unintended consequences of having this, uh, this, this rule. Uh, you, may, you may mean well, but we're very concerned about kind of the possible downsides of, of having this uh, legislation even. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I think first of all, I'd like thank you for the, uh, the sorry, the presentation. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, actually, this question is regarding uh, critical thinking. I think we've been edging around it. Uh, a lot of things we talk about, like, uh, right state, I mean, uh, not ready for, for the critical thinking or um, talking about someone being cheated, uh, highly educated, uh, ready for t critical thinking but still getting you know, uh, cheated basically. So uh, this is a very psychological issue. We have a lot of biases towards mo emotionality, uh, towards, uh, towards uh, uh, stereotypes, towards all these kind of things, towards groups, uh, what, we, what we understand is real in the world. So my, my question is actually, um, so you were talking about trust. In critical thinking, there's a need for you to not trust. <laughs> there's a healthy skepticism. So where, how do we get ourselves ready uh, to, for that state where we are not so trusting, but at the same time being able to discern what is trustworthy and not? I don't... Sh Okay, so one of the reasons why I look at the information warfare aspect of it is that we are, some of this, and the reason why I also don't focus on fake news, I use information <coughs> warfare instead, is that some of it is true but biased. So I don't even care whether it's fake or not. It's just that it is information put there to create an emotional response. Unfortunately, the emotional response hits us before critical thinking starts. Critical thinking is important because we must apply critical thinking. But when this is information warfare, it's targeted to hit us so that we won't even start the critical thinking. So that is a problem. So the, in order to do that, we need to get ourselves into a culture, into a psychological habit of not responding instantly to that kind of information that comes in. That we stop, think, pause, and then go into the critical thinking mode. Or if we don't have time to go into critical thinking mode, we put this on a shelf and do not share. So that, that is what we're talking about. This becomes like um, your self-defense. Self-defense is when you actually have all the moves already and you have, your, you have practiced your kung fu, uh, wipe, the, uh, wipe the left, wipe right, karate kid. Yeah. So that when they come and attack you, you can just go swipe left or swipe right. Same thing when you see the news, you just swipe left <laughs> or swipe right and get rid of it rather than at that point in time, you don't want to think, should I use the monkey pose or the dragon fight? You, know? you want to be able to think, or oh, what kind of critical thinking? You want to say, okay, do I think about this now critically, or shall I just shelve it? But whatever it is, I won't share it. That's my thought. And if you have the trust, then you can actually help to start at the emotional level first, to, so that you build, gives you time to get to the critical thinking phase. Um, this, this past week, I had an interesting, uh, uh, def what we call a defense, uh, confirmation of the research of a master's students. Okay, so uh, for those of you not so familiar, uh, what happens is that before you do your PhD or the master's, you have to show that your work before you start is, is, is in good shape. So it's called a defense of the study, right? Okay, then you have confirmation, then okay, you can start. So this... Uh, uh, issue was um, um, why do people, why do women avoid breast cancer screening? Okay, because breast cancer is, in, is increasing, uh, seems to be the case globally, 
Um, but the screening rate, people going for the screen is actually falling, right? So the theory here is there's uncertainty and so forth, right? But one interesting thing is that um, if you are very certain, you will then you will not look for information. Okay. So um, the irony in this critical thinking part of it is that we have to behave as if we are uncertain. Because if you behave like you're very certain, then you will need information. You will need new information. It's like what you're seeing in the, certain in the, in, in, in the US, those uh, Trump supporters, they're certain that he is right, that he uh, has got on, on his side, uh, that, he's, that he's taking care of the interest. <coughs> Whatever he does is correct. They are absolutely certain. Okay. So, okay, yes, hang, on, hang on with me for a second, right? You have to be certain that you are uncertain. Okay. Meaning that you are looking for information that maybe you are wrong. You have to be ready to accept that you may be wrong. And this is part of critical thinking. Because if you are sure that you are right, then nobody will shake you, you know. And then you can be taken in by, by false information and by bias as well, true but biased information. So that's, that's a very, very tricky part of it. How do you maintain this? It is a balance, eh? because some of us go mad, you know. There's certain but uncertainty, then, you know, where are you, eh? okay? Uh, so that's sort of one part of it. Now, you have to be sort of open-minded without letting your brains fall out. <coughs> to open-minded, their brains just fall out, right? Okay. The second thing is this. Uh, like I was telling you, uh, this, just, I was just talking over dinner, in fact, with this, uh, uh, this research assistant, right? That uh, we're doing a paper together, in fact, on this point that it seems like when you are under threat, okay, with people sending you false information, propaganda, deliberately. Uh, he's from Indonesia, and in this uh, place called Ambon, Okay, it's a very, it's improved of course, but it was a bad situation where um, the, uh, this one publisher owns both the Muslim and Indian uh, and Christian newspapers. Newspapers in from, intended for Muslims and newspapers intended for Christians. It got so polarized that the newsroom literally divided down the middle. Christians on one side, Muslim on the other side. So they were, the Muslim newspaper report the injury done to the Muslims and how they had to fight back. And then the Christians have a report about injury done to Christians and how they should fight back. Right. So it got really, really bad. And they say that when the news sort of went out, the, those in the communities right, who tried to, to make peace, um, people sort of retracted. I mentioned your small world theory, right? so looking at small world theory. People kind of retracted the small world and then look at people whom they can trust for information. So this is the point about your critical thing. Who do you trust? Right? You trust a smaller circle of people. Right? You don't trust everybody now. Your world becomes smaller. You trust uh, your mainstream papers, actually, because by and large, it can be trusted for facts anyway. Right? You, can, you can check whether it's true or not. You can be held accountable. Uh, so your world, in a way, becomes smaller, which is why it's not so good. I mean, you really want a, a big world. But when you can't trust, then, of course, you, you, you shrink. So some strategies that people have adopted, they seem to be successful to some extent in counteracting propaganda and, and fake news. Yeah, so that's certainly one, one way. Yeah. But it does require uh, resources, so there are teams um, among them, the um, Ambonese, the Muslims and Christians who met literally at the border, coffee shops, and, and discussed, and then say, okay, no, nobody's going to come attack you, no, nobody's going to come to attack you as well, and then, you know, and then try and spread that, that, that news as well. Yeah. But it does require um, effort and resources. Hello, good evening. Uh, <clears throat> Regarding this uh, fake news, I, I think it has uh, very serious consequences on society. So uh, perhaps maybe uh, the government can introduce uh, some legislation, maybe a fake news act to uh, introduce penalties, and uh, it, with penalties like uh, fines and all that. So I think people will be very uh, skeptical, or, or maybe uh, they, they will be uh, not so fast in... Uh, passing on for, uh, false information. Uh, after all, we are a fine country here. Yeah, I've written an op-ed on this. You, you search my name and then a fake news, you probably see the op-ed that I wrote. Uh, the op-ed that I wrote said that we should def uh, confine whatever legislation to the election period. Okay, because you look at the harm. Okay, so NTUC is accused of selling plastic rice. Okay, what is the harm of that? 
right? Okay, like NTUC loses some sales, but you'll bounce back, right? Um, I just got a fake, fake news from somebody sent me, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger slept under a statue, his own <coughs> statue at a hotel because the hotel said that there's no room for him. Now there's no longer governor. Uh, they promised him a room in a, in a hotel, but now there's no longer governor. They're not giving you a room. Lesson, we no longer in power. Nobody cares about you. Okay, but it's fake news. Huh? Okay. He slept under that statue, but it was for some, some play or some movie or something, right? What's the harm of that, right? Okay. So um, there are fake news that it doesn't cause harm, okay, but the fake news that causes harm. So the issue is what is the harm, right? So my view is that based on what we see, okay, because it, there's so much fake news, if you want to talk about fake news, so much out there, you know, you spend resources all the time, it's difficult. So let's confine it to where the, the most serious harm would be, right? So most serious, serious harm would be election period. You choose the wrong candidate, right? Okay, so let's keep it to, in your case, only nine days. Right? We can take nine days. And then there's cooling off period, so eight days. Right? Eight days, can. I mean, pour, pour the sauce into eight days, right? And then uh, I do that. Um, I mentioned that the, the, the just highlighting fake news itself can cause some disquiet among people. So it can, it can to some extent, corrode trust uh, in society as a whole. So it's not so, not so good a thing to say, well, okay, there's fake news going around. It's a dark person walking around with a knife and a black sword, you know, be careful, right? You don't want to have that, you like, okay, where do I go, right? You don't want that to, 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 to happen. Uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's not a, a good thing to have. So my, my view is that you should keep it as short a time as possible uh, while recognizing that, yeah, it, it can cause some, but at least to, to the shortest time uh, possible. Can you say something? Yeah. So this uh, came up in the representations that I made before the Select Committee of Parliament. Uh, it's on the video on the Parliament website and also in my written submission. The laws, we actually have laws already. Sedition laws, Internet Security Act, which can be used if people are spreading things which are going to cause harm. And <coughs> if you want to get more specific, as Peng Hwa said, you can really focus on it during election period. Um, so my next concern is that laws are good to some extent, uh, but against an actual information warfare campaign, it's very easy to overcome a law because it is actually easy to, for example, the example I gave is I put up five different pieces of news, one after another, maybe about one week apart. First one, completely fake. Two and three, half fake, half true. Fourth one, true but bias. Last one, true but it looks fake because you can't really tell. Now, all of this could be, somebody could report them and by law they could be taken down. But if this is part of my campaign, I will get a screenshot of all of this before they're taken down. And at the end of it, I'm going to have a sixth one saying, look, government took down these five of which these ones are true. What are they trying to hide? And I don't spread that on social media, I spread it on WhatsApp. This, we are talking about a campaign, which this is like nation versus nation is beyond law already. So laws are already there. So for, um, if anybody here is thinking of spreading uh, seditious rumours, please don't. You know, penalties are high. But we have to be aware also that law has its limits and law has to be also executed very carefully because we also don't want people to say, look, we are clamping down on freedom of speech, clamping down on political dissent. What is this country? This country cannot be trusted. That's also the negative side. So we have to be careful how the law is applied. Yeah, uh, you just reminded me of something, and that is that, um, so, so Ben is talking about the sort of uh, assuming some state coming in to you know, um, uh, spread this kind of news. But I'm looking from the point of view of some commercial gain. Um, Right, and, and if you look at commercial gain, okay, so where was it happening most, right? So these are large countries, okay, uh, where you have millions of viewers. So um, uh, the Macedonian sites, uh, you know, spreading uh, fake news about uh, the US election, they made uh, $3,000 a month, and I haven't visited Macedonia. $3,000 a month is quite a bit of money in Macedonia. It's a poor country, former Yugoslav Republic, okay. Um, but in Singapore, our total number of viewers uh, is very small. They can't make much money from us. Uh. It's really, okay, kopi and maybe one good meal, 
Okay, you can't make three thousand uh, dollars in in Singapore from any YouTube, you know, viral video. You cannot. That's impossible. Physically impossible. So, so the I think the financial incentive in Singapore is 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 next to nil. Maybe not nil, but next to nil. So that leaves the issue of who else might be interested in sending out uh, this kind of fake uh, content. So that's where you know I, I think possibly okay some uh, agency, some state, somebody might want uh, you know election to go one way. So it looks like maybe not not financial gain, but then if not financial gain, you know, is it is it can you capture that so easily uh, using law or not? Okay, so that's where it gets you know tricky, and this, that's why I can come and talk about his his work. Yeah. Uh, does it mean that Singapore doesn't have a uh, uh, proactive um, uh, system to fight with uh, fake news? For example, in China two days ago, uh, a platform, government platform was introduced. It's called uh, Piao, Refuting Rumors. And 27 government organizations uh, uh, joined uh, to fight fake news. Uh, so what about Singapore at government level? Mainly you told about fighting fake news at level of a person, just uh, don't spread. But there is next level, level of community. So what is done proactively in, uh, at this level? Thank you. So the f fact is that Singapore government has a, set of, a site which I believe is called Factually that does fact-checking. How many of you have heard of Factually or visited Factually? One person out of this whole, two persons, yes? So it goes to show you how popular that site is, how effective it is. It's necessary, but... Um, do we have independent fact-checkers in Singapore? Anybody? We have one, we have one guy, then he gave up because no, he, was, he was too tiring. Uh, if anybody here has would would step up, I mean that would really help. The best are grassroots efforts, because the government is has a site. The different agencies are actually looking at different aspects. Uh, for example, MUIS, the um, the team that looks into whether food is halal or not, they are very active on that because there are people posting all kinds of uh, uh, misinformation about what is halal, what's not halal. So they are very actively counteracting that on social media. But as for a larger one, it's just... And, and for government to... I mean, one of the most popular fake news is that government is lying to you. So if government fact-checking website says, no, we're not lying to you, <laughs> who's believes that? Yeah, actually, uh, this issue of uh, the government side is very uh, uh, tricky. Uh, because uh, as, as uh, Ben has said, the government can be accused of, um, you know, its own bias. Um, so they have the factually uh, site, but it, it's put out, uh, and they just literally just put out uh, the facts, uh, right? Just, you know, it, it doesn't sort of respond to all allegations, but just uh, uh, the facts. Um, and as Ben also pointed out, that it, there's a tendency to blame the government uh, for some kind of conspiracy uh, theory. So the government is in a very tight spot, uh, and in fact, Obed, I wrote as well that you know um, most governments, if not all governments, have some kind of national myth. Uh, and by myth, I don't mean like lie, right? Okay, like in Singapore, so one of our myths is that, right? We have narrative, yeah. We have no resources, right? Only people. So we take care of people, right? Okay. Um, we have other uh, narratives that okay, we, Singapore is like okay, when fishing village, then forever stick on you, right? <laughs> That's how we went, right? So we all have a little myth, and and. And in a way, these are necessary for our identity. So um, the thing is that if you probe a little further, uh, these narratives often uh, break down at some point. So if you kind of probe too deeply, you find, hey, this part is not really true. Huh? Singapore was not a fishing village when Stanford Raffles found us. Huh? We found fine China in some you know, hill in some can Fort Canning or whatever, right? Uh, we were trading port already, actually, right? So if you probe further, you find actually these uh, narratives break down. So, this is where it gets really uh, tricky, right? So the government wants to, to stop uh, fake news and your, your fake content, but also all governments have some element of this issue of, you know, the narrative, which is part of our, our own identity. Yeah? So it's kind of how do you balance that? I would say that uh, I think many of us are heartened by the approach of the government. They're very careful. Okay, unlike some other countries that we want to mention, that rush legislation through, right? 
Uh, and then, of course, cause disaster. I mean, it's really a disastrous uh, act, and fortunately, it's been repealed, right? Um, but the government's much more uh, considered effort. I, I get it. Actually, I, this is you know hearsay, right? But I get that they are uh, getting inputs after the select committee is still talking to people about it, and you can see they're taking a long time to come up with the with the with the act. I, I, I get it; they will come out eventually, but hearsay again. Um, but they're taking much more considered time to to come up with with, with this. It's potentially uh, damaging to us. Eh? undermine trust, and like I said, we have a high level of trust in the government. So actually, we want to try and maintain that if we can, yeah? I think we have to be mindful when it comes to regulating fake news. There's a distinction between facts and opinion. Right? The same set of facts could be painted either for the ultra-rightists or the leftists. Right? Um, it's essential that you do not create another fake news act to replace the Sedition Act, which has a high signature, which everyone knows it has a very high signature before you use it. So you don't want to use one act to replace another one, which essentially would do the same. So I think it's again important to distinguish one, facts from opinion, and you could have different opinions over the same set of facts, and that should not be viewed as seditious. You do not like it, well, read something else, write something about it, but don't ignore it or say it's fake. Thanks. Just a comment, I guess. Um, I think yesterday, right? Was it yesterday? Yesterday they had a talk. Uh, I don't know if some of you here went, um, uh, talking about the okay, they, they, title alone is engaging. Um, title alone, right? Sorry, a very nice a title, right? Uh, the Shamogam uh, PJ Tam encounter, you know, three issues in uh, history writing in Singapore. Uh, and it was a full house, right? Uh, talking about how um, the, the Shamogam and Ta uh, Tam encounter really was a uh, different uh, approaches. So, uh, you know, Minister Shamogam approached it from a legal point of view. You know, where's the evidence, right? Uh, this happened and you say this, you ignore this, so you ignore some evidence. Um, but from the historian's point of view, uh, that's not how history is conducted. History is not conducted in the same way as in the courts. Okay, so it's so not that either of them were wrong and, or, you know, this person of, you know, con did consider things, but um, from a histo historian perspective, it is, uh, it is different. So I think uh, your point certainly is valid. The uh, fact, you know, the uh, fact should be noted, the opinion should be allowed. But in our postmodern world, right, it's very hard to draw a decision between fact and opinion, right? You, you, because issue of interpretation, right? So you, whether certain facts are relevant or not, depends on inf interpretation of this. So from a histori historian point of view, even something like, Fact and opinion is really hard to, to distinguish, so it's it's a really really uh, tricky uh, tricky area. Right? Just talking about what is what is a fact is really tricky in itself. Um, so the, the the point about this is that it comes down also to the issue of perspective, uh, and we're talking about sort of your, your rigorous academic perspective, both legal both uh, valid the legal perspective and the historic historical historian perspective. Both are valid, but they can have different emphasis on what is relevant, what are facts, and what are opinion even. I, I'm, I'm Peter Lim, <coughs> RSIS. Uh, first, I must say that as a former straight science person, uh, it was uh, heartening to hear Prof. Ang and a few others say that we will trust mainstream media because straight times, among many people, score very low in terms of credibility. Right? But it's a fact that, uh, like, the Trump bump. We now have a fake news bump for the Straits Times too. You know? uh, but that's, not, that's just a comment. My question is this. I think it goes beyond the details of fact and non-fact. It's about trust and emotions. Brexit is a good example. UK is one of the freest countries in the world in terms of freedom of expression. Yet, so many lies were told in the campaign and the, and the guys got away with it. All kinds of reasons for that, right? It's too complicated to go into here. How Trump got elected in, in the United States, one of the freest countries in the world. India, one of the most freest countries in the world in terms of freedom of expression. Yet all kinds of things happened there. So we got a problem here. And one current problem 
which touches not so much on fake news, but on trust and, uh, and how we communicate, is do we really own an HDB flat? Yeah. So that's a big issue. And how it gets resolved will be a good test on how our government and our people respond. Because how we tackle that problem and come to a consensus of what it really is will be a good formula for us to tackle fake news. Thank you. Uh, those who don't know, Peter Lim was the editor of Straits Times for decades, yeah, in the 70s and 80s. Well, it's been three years, but not, not years, so long. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And now he's at RSIS. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. And um, Peter's made a very important point also that sometimes, you know, a lot of this actually works on existing issues that are in society. And while we are looking at the informational part of it, we also have to remember that the social part of it, the has to be also resolved. We can't say, oh, you know, this thing is biased, but then forget that there's actual issues. Like the split between elites and heartland. It can be amplified with the information warfare, but if there is an existing income gap that is too great, that is still an issue that needs to be addressed. We can't just focus on the information part of it and not take care of the social part of it. So that we need to take care of that. Hey, I just uh, comment on this point that uh, follow up on Peter's uh, point. I was a journalist in a, a now defunct newspaper called the Singapore Monitor. Um, I was a branch union then when it uh, folded. Um, so I kind of had a, a sort of closer look than being a journalist, uh, okay, apart from editors, of course. Um, what happens in a paper, uh, it was a broadsheet, uh, sorry, it was a, a tabloid. They wanted to go to the broadsheet, right? Uh, then there was the elections of 80, 84, right? And uh, Part of wanting to go to a, to a broadsheet in the morning, to a tabloid in the afternoon, uh, was that the, the, the leaders thought we should please the, the PAP. Um, so it went full hog to, uh, to the PAP. I remember one uh, Sunday where there was what we call copy tasting, meaning that you read the news and then, you know, uh, when you come in raw from the report and then you, you edit it. I read one, and this is from a suppose a senior uh, person, but clearly a PAP member. Uh, he, you know, he admitted he was right. And I said, "This is rubbish, man. Unprintable. Really, I'm, I mean, I'm a junior guy, right? I just joined, like, I was fresh out of law school, worked there two years, and then hey, this is rubbish, unprintable. I threw it aside. No, editor says, no, you have to run it. This is rubbish. So they took it and ran it. Okay, the paper was was even more pro PAP than the Straits Times, right?" But circulation held while the election was on. The Sunday that we had uh, the, the news, the Saturday was the election that all that covered. <coughs> Sunday, we had a, the, the, the headline that beat the paper because our headline was Chum and Jaya win. And the uh, straight times were like, PAP win 78 out of 80 or something like that, right? Uh, so that's, that's, that, that Sunday paper sold out. Monday, the circulation dived and never recovered. Uh, and the paper folded after about, maybe about a year after that, right? Um, I think the lesson that the government has taken clearly taken away is that when you are really, you know, biased and seem to be biased, and I remember dining at this place after the paper folder interview by Straits Times, um, and they said, hey, you know, you, you a monitor is so biased, you know. It's a waiter telling me, you know. <laughs> so biased. So embarrassed, right? Um, the lesson that the government took away was that when you are so biased, then you're, you're, you're no longer trusted. The people will kind of reject you. So if you look at the paper, the paper I, know, I know it's kind of crazy to say this, but the, the newspaper is, is, there are key sort of controls by the government. Not, not, the, not every word, nah, not, 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 it's sort of structural control, right? It is done um, with an eye that, you know, you have to uh, allow the paper to still have trust among people. If it's just too entirely pro-government, then it, it, has, it has no value to anybody. It's also no value to the people because it's, you know, clearly biased. It's not very to the government either because you know people don't read it, it's not trusted. So it's kind of a tricky balance, and you know uh, Peter will know the job. It's it's a, it's a tough job, right? But you have to maintain the trust of people. So the media uh, will still have to you know uh, keep the trust uh, going. Yes, sir. Okay. Very quickly, um, uh, just a follow up on that. Um, but then contemporary uh, situation, right? You have obviously bias 
news organizations doing very well, maybe not in Singapore, but, but overseas. Um, um, and if we, I had a project where we did a content analysis of fake news articles that went viral um, in the US. Um, we were trying to compare fake news with real news articles across different measures, um, news values, um, format, um, uh, uh, sourcing patterns. Fake news look very similar to real news, except in one category, which is objectivity. So fake news are very subjective. About 70% of all fake news we, we analyzed are subjective. They included opinions of authors. Um, in contrast, 70% um, of news articles we analyze are very objective. Um, and yet, we have this phenomenon where fake news has overtaken real news in terms of virality. So it looks like being biased actually sells. Yeah, so I think that's the case of Fox, right? I think Fox, Fox News uh, in the US, the profit of Fox News is equivalent to the profit of all other news, TV news combined. So therefore, it pays in the U.S. certainly to be biased, right? So that's where it gets tricky. This is not a situation in Singapore. We are, I mean, we, this is not a, it's a, it's not a good situation to be in in the U.S. where Fox News is, the profits are way better than anybody else. Uh, so that's not, not a good situation, and we are not in that situation. So, you know, we are sort of in a happier state. Okay. Um, I'm afraid we ran out of time. I wish I could give one more, but I'm running out of time, and I want to thank uh, Kenam for this opportunity to talk to you folks about uh, fake news, and thank you for being so attentive at an audience. Yeah, thank you so much, and of course, we will thank our speakers as well for their very insightful uh, sharing, and of course, all of you, very, very good questions. Um, I think before you go, um, a, a couple of things. One is that uh, a bit of prelude. Um, the talk for next month will be on the 20th of September and it will be very interesting called Industry 4.0. So the Dean of our College of Engineering will be touching on that and probably will touch on some of the skills required you know, to, to, to be able to survive you know, in, in Industry 4.0. So do look out for the advertisement and then um, join us. And secondly, of course, the, the buses are there waiting for you to, for those who are, you are taking buses. And lastly, we would like to Thank our speakers and we want to present them a, a small token of appreciation. Okay? Thank you. So thanks a lot. Um, have a very wonderful weekend. <laughs>